All right, shalom, everybody. Coming through again. Got another quick lesson that I'm gonna go through. Uh, this one's dealing with the specific topic of 400 years slavery prophecy that was given to Abraham back, as you can see here, that I have pulled up in Genesis chapter 15, right around about verses 12 through 14. All right. Now, the reason why I'm doing this video is because, for one, most of the camps that are out there that you uh, see, you know, as far as concerning being somewhat mainstream, more so only on YouTube, but, you know, the various camps that you see in cities all over the United States, uh, most of them don't ever go into this topic or ever really break this down and show how it is that when you study out other scriptures as far as chronology elsewhere in the Masoretic text, because today I'm going to show you the Masoretic text, I'm going to show you the uh, Samaritan Pentateuch, and then I'm also going to show you the Septuagint. Then we're going to maybe pull up a few things from uh, Josephus, but the thing I wanted to really point out is, is that they never really show you how it could possibly be 430 years, which is uh, derived from uh, Exodus 12 and 40. They don't never really show you how in 430 years uh, you get that time of them being there. When you look at the fact that Levi came into Egypt with Jacob, when Jacob was uh, 130 years old and somehow or another from Levi to Moses you have 430 years okay I'm going to show you that that context is completely impossible for a number of reasons but I'm also going to pull out the facts pull out the scriptures I'm going to go through and break down certain portions of this prophecy here um, as far as going down later in the chapter here but for the most part, um, I just want to bring out this information for edification for the elect and for all those of Israel that are, have a sincere heart for learning. All right. Um, so, you know, get your pen and your paper out and take some notes here because we're going to go through a lot of scriptures. OK. All right. So let's just start it off. So we'll read the prophecy that was actually given to Abraham. All right, so this is Genesis chapter 15, verse 12. And it reads, And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abel, and lo, and horror of great darkness fell upon him. Verse 13, And he said unto Abel, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. All right. So this is the portion that I really want to deal with, um, but we're going to bring out a few other pieces of edification just to nail the point home later on in the video. I'm going to try and keep it short, but so from right here, it clearly tells you, and this is one of the first things that I want to bring up. It clearly tells you, and they shall afflict them 400 years. All right. Now, this is a prophecy given to Abraham after he fell into a deep sleep. OK. Directly from the most high Yahweh. Now. This would be a situation where it would be no different from, let's say, Jeremiah receiving a vision, Daniel receiving a vision, Ezekiel receiving a vision. Any of the major prophets that we all know of that received visions and wrote down their visions, Ezra, all this, any of the major prophets that received visions and that were given uh, any type of time period, we know that according to prophecy, that the time period happened just as it was supposed to. So the first point I want to bring up is that when you read Exodus, and then we'll just go ahead and hop there real quick. Exodus chapter 12, verse 40. You're going to see something here. This will be one of the first dead giveaways of anyone that studies scripture. 
And it reads, now the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. Now, what I want to bring out is, is that a lot of people try to ascribe this to uh, certain things in the scriptures as far as the Masoretic text, uh, especially, and then dealing with the King James Version. I'm not going to say that the Masoretic text is not to be used or it shouldn't be the majority text that we would go to. But what I'm saying is, is that being a learned, studied, skilled scribe in the law of the Most High Yahweh, we must be able to know the differences between when something is done in a translation that's contextually wrong and something that's just blatantly trying to mislead you and go down a different path. Because like I was mentioning earlier with the prophets, when the prophecy was given that the children of Israel would go into slavery in Babylon for 70 years, did they stay there uh, 75? Did they stay there uh, 110? No, it was the exact amount of time that was prophesied. So off rip, this is the first uh, uh, rebuttal I would have for anyone that says that uh, this fulfilled that prophecy that was given to Abraham because coming directly out of the mouth of, out of, mouth of the Most High, th this is by default doesn't meet the criteria because it was 430 years. Now, the first uh, real other rebuttal that I want to bring out is you deal with uh, right here, which is the Septuagint that I have pulled up here, translated into English. Uh, I'm going to show you why I say that the Masoretic text here still is contextually correct, but the way that the doctrine has been propagated from this text is off. It's wrong. It's not true. It's not biblical, it's not dealing with true biblical fact and what you can prove through the scriptures. All right. So this is Exodus 12 and 40 from the Septuagint version. It says, Now the sojourning of the children of Israel and fathers of them who dwelt in Cana and in Egypt was 430 years. Okay. Now Let's read verse 41 in this as well. And it came to pass at the end of the 430 years, even the selfsame day, it came to pass that all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. All right. So it's letting you know right here that the very same day that they had entered in was the very same day that they had left out within that 430 year context. All right. But what you got to notice here in verse 40 is that it says the sojourning of the children of Israel and the fathers of them, all right, who dwelt in Canaan, all right? So that's a second point that I want to bring out because in these other texts, and even when you deal with Josephus, it shows you that the 430 years is not all dealing with simply slavery in Egypt, but also the time from when Abraham entered into uh, Canaan at the age of 75, all the way down to Moses leading the children of Israel out of Egypt, which was at Moses being 80 years old. All right. So now I want to bring up the... Uh, Samaritan Pentateuch, all right? This is basically uh, the Torah or the Tharorah um, as far as another version, all right, which they call the Samaritan Pentateuch. But um, this is just another version. Um, there are a lot of differences in this compared to the Masoretic text. But for the most part, uh, this generally gives the same consensus. It's just certain words in certain places are different, all right? But what I want to show here is that with the Samaritan Pentateuch and also with the Septuagint, you see that the culmination of the idea or the context that's uh, presented when you read Exodus 12 and 40 is not that it exists in the Masoretic translation, all right? So 
Because even when you go into the Hebrew of the Masoretic, it doesn't say anything near what these say. All right, so uh, this is the Samaritan Pentateuch, chapter 12, verse 40. And the sojourning of the children of Israel, and I'm right around here, while they sojourned the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan was 430 years. And it came to pass after the 430 years, all the forces of the Lord came forth out of the land of Egypt by night. All right. So here we have it clearly stated again that the 430 years was a combination of the sojourn in Egypt and in Canaan. All right, so this is the first uh, few points that I wanted to bring up here. Uh, and then also the next thing that I want to go into is that we're going to go back to Genesis. Chapter 15. I want to show a few more points here. All right. And we're going to scroll down. We're going to go to end of the chapter okay now this is what you need to pay very close attention to all right verse 18 in the same day the lord made a covenant with abram saying unto thy seed have i given this land and from the river of egypt unto the great river the river euphrates all right so and then it goes on to list all of these people, which he's going to let them know that it's their land, but he's now giving it, it was currently their land, but he's now giving it to Abraham and his seed. All right. So what I wanted to pull out of this one verse here is that it's, first of all, Abraham was just given the covenant. So from this point on, you, you should go ahead and consider from the river Euphrates throughout scripture all the way until the great river in Egypt. That, that is the uh, landmass of the children of Israel as far as concerning the promised land. All right. So let's just pull up a little map here. I don't know how well you'll be able to see it because it's kind of small, but this is one of the best renditions of this because most of the renditions only follow uh, a, a small portion of the Nile River, and they don't include the westmost portion of the Nile Delta. And I'll bring that up real quick. Which I'm talking about here. When you look at this image here of the Nile Delta, all of these uh, uh, flowing portions of the Nile here going into the Delta, all of these uh, were just simply different names of the uh nile like the uh you know technically they have different names now but for visual purposes i want you to show you what's done on most of the promised land when people uh pull out the promised land they'll start here with this eastmost portion and then they'll only go down uh a, a little past cairo and say that you know that's what's included but i would argue that it goes all the way to the westmost part portion of the delta going all the way over to the river euphrates which is shown back in this image okay because if you can see my mouse most of the uh people that draw these maps or uh claim that the, what's the promised land they start right around in here, all right? They don't know, go all the way down encompassing most of the river Nile. Now, and then, then that overtakes Saudi Arabia, Iraq, uh, Syria, and all of that thing, all of that. And, and the fact of it is, is that even when you look into the uh, biblical history, um, it was already in past times, we, we overtook most portions of these lands, but we lost them throughout our different captivities and when the kingdom was split. But this is just giving you a visual of what was just promised to Abraham, okay? And the reason why I want to pull this up is because 
the third rebuttal point that I want to bring out in this video is concerning when they went down into Egypt, that doesn't fulfill any portion of the prophecy anyways, because they were not in a land that was not theirs. I'll say it again. They were not in a land that was not theirs. When you look at where they were uh, building the treasure cities or the treasury cities, which are also called strong cities, and that's where Pharaoh kept most of the, uh, his armies and different things like that. And there was also a third one, um, which was closer to Cairo, which is uh, Heliopolis. That isn't listed in scripture, but we know through outside history that that was also a strong city or a treasure city. Um, when you look at Pithom and Ramesses, some people uh, point out that uh, Ramesses and Pithom are slightly different areas, but they all are within this area right here. All right. And even when you look at the fact that this whole area is called Goshen, and then when you go back to these uh, images on the map, you will see that right here in the Nile Delta is where it's the greenest. So even when the children of Israel came into Egypt, Joseph knew Egypt enough to send them to the Bethlehem of land, which was in the Nile Delta. That was the richest and the most fertile. Now, another thing that I want to pull out here is, is the fact that when you go back to the prophecy, it states that of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs and shall serve them and they shall afflict them 400 years. Now, like I was saying, all of this area is still Israelite territory going all the way back to Abraham. Okay. So when Jacob and the 12 patriarchs and the 70 souls that came down into the land of Egypt, you got to understand that they were basically moving from one portion of their land, according to the prophecy, according to the covenant, they were moving from one portion of their own land into another portion. Currently, that portion of the land was uh, ruled by another people, but that's no different from them sitting in Canaan being ruled by the Canaanites and the Jebusites and the Amorites. So the Egyptians that were down in this portion of Egypt were no different from Canaanites, Jebusites, Amorites, and all of them. It's just that the others, the Most High had given strict orders to basically wipe those five nations out that are the five specific nations that he brought up. But the thing is, is that the Egyptians were no more than uh, taking on and sitting on their land, no, no different from the Moabites and the Ammonites. But the Moabites and the Ammonites, their small portions was not to be touched with, but everything else was fair game. All right. So I wanted to bring that out. They were not in a land that was not theirs. This everywhere they were in Egypt was their land, basically. All right. Because when we read through the scriptures, it says that they were sent to Goshen by Joseph and that they built treasure cities of Pithom and Ramesses. And those all fit within that geographical location, which is called the promised land to Abraham. All right. Not what's looked at as the modern day state of Israel. All right. I'm talking about the full given land of Genesis 15, which is far greater than what they have set up. In the nation state of Israel today. All right. So now that we've brought out that point, I also want to go to my next rebuttal point. To anybody that says that children of Israel were in Egypt for 430 years, that's just not true. That's just a lie. Okay. And it's all derived from the Masoretic text in the King James Version. Because you cannot pull that out of the Septuagint or the Samaritan Pentateuch. You just can't pull that type of content out of those translations. 
because those are the proper translations. We're going to see simply only dealing with the Masoretic text from here on out, all right? Because we're going to show with chronology elsewhere that everything is not adding up, okay? All right, so for my next point, I want to show that Abraham came into the land of Canaan at the age of 75, all right? So let's go to Genesis Chapter 21, no, I believe it's Genesis 12. Let me go back to uh, Genesis 12. And we're going to go to about verse 4 and 5. All right. So this is Genesis 12, 4 and 5 from the King James, which is the Masoretic text. It says, So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed out of Haran. All right. So let's read the next. So we know Abram 75, verse 5. And Abram took Sarah, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance, substance that they had gathered and the souls that they had gotten in Haran. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, all right, and into the land of Canaan they came. So here it clearly tells you within the Masoretic text in its own chronology that Abraham came into the land of Canaan at the age of 75, all right, because we're going to show you, a, I'm going to show you a context of time, all right, so we got Abraham coming into the land at 75. Next, let's see how long it was when until uh isaac was born okay so now we're going to jump to genesis 21 and we're going to read verse 5 and it reads and abraham was an hundred years old when his son isaac was born unto him Okay, so we had Abraham coming in at 75 into Canaan. So now when Isaac is born, he's 100. So that means 25 years have elapsed since Abraham first entered. Okay, so now we have 25 years that he's been there. Let's see if this is, let's see if we can get to 230 that is spoken of in the Samaritan Pentateuch and the Septuagint or are we going to be able to substantiate only 430 years just from Levi to Moses? Okay. Now, next thing we're going to look up is how old was Isaac when he had Jacob? Okay. Because this is going to show another elapse of time. So now we're going to go to 25. Verse 26. And I'm going to touch on the scriptures that people try to bring out in other places, which is very little, but we're going to touch that too. I want to prove out these points that I have. All right. So, Genesis 25, verse 26. It says, And after that came his brother out and took, and his hand took hold on Esau's heel. And his name was called Jacob. And Isaac was three score years old when she bare them. All right. So now that just gave Isaac's age at the birth of Esau and Jacob. So we already had 25. So from Isaac to being born to him having Esau and Jacob, we now have another 60 years because that's what three score is in scripture. So now we have 60 plus 25, all right, which is 85 years. So now we just seen that. This is simple math, simple chronology that's in scripture that's been in your Bibles since the Bible has been written, all right? So now we're going to go to Genesis 47. I 
Let's do eight through nine. So let's see what this says. And Pharaoh said unto Jacob, how old art thou? And Jacob said unto Pharaoh, the days of the years of my pilgrimage are an hundred and thirty years. Few and evil have the days of the years of my life been and have not attained unto the days of the years of the life of my fathers in the days of their pilgrimage. Okay. So what it's showing you here is, is that Jacob, when he went into Egypt, was 130 years old. So now we just have another elapse of time that's going to give us a context of time that's going to show us exactly how long Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob dwelt in the land of Canaan. All right? So Abraham entering at 75 to Isaac being born is 25 years. From Isaac to having Jacob and Esau, that is another 60 years. And just have to add on the last 130 years from Jacob because he's now entered into Egypt. Okay. So, what does that give us? 25 plus 60 plus 830 equals 215 years. All right. So, that's half of the 430 that's spoken of in Exodus 12 and 40. Hmm. So that means with from Abraham coming into Canaan to Jacob leaving out of Canaan going into Egypt was only a 215-year context, then it is impossible that Jacob's son, Levi, going into Egypt to Jacob's son's grandson, Moses coming out of Egypt to be a 430 year context if no one in the latter, meaning from Levi, Jacob to Moses, if none of those men lived longer than Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, because even Jacob's testimony here shows that he was not, he didn't even get to live as long as his forefathers. So, you're going to have to start adding more years to people's lives to be able to get 430 from the time of Levi entering to the time of Moses leaving. See, the, what I'm showing here is that the context is completely impossible because guess what? We do have the year spans of certain other men. All right. So let's get ready to pull that out. All right, so we we see that, and I'll, I'll just run through this really quick because I want to keep the video as short as possible. So we have Abraham lived to be 175. That's in Genesis 25 and 7. We have Isaac lived to be 180. That's in Genesis 35 and 28. We have Jacob lived to be 147, which is in Genesis 47 and 28. Levi lived to be 137. That is Exodus 6 and 16. The age of Jacob is not given, but the age of Moses was 120, and that is in Deuteronomy 34 and 7. So clearly when you go through those scriptures and you see that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was living upwards of 180 years, though Jacob did not get, you know, as close we see that Levi at 37 and Moses at 120 it is only presumable that Jacob lived somewhere in between 137 and 120 years old. All right. So you cannot possibly attribute a 430 year time span from Levi entering. And Levi didn't enter. Levi wasn't born in Egypt. Levi uh, wasn't a young child in Egypt. Levi was a grown man in Egypt. All right. So you cannot possibly ascribe from him coming into Egypt to them leaving out of Egypt at his grandson, Moses, 430 years. It's completely impossible. 
All right. Now, and also, what you can pull up is the lineage of Levi, and I'll give you the scriptures of that as well. And that's going to be in Exodus 6, verses 16 through 20, Numbers 26, verse 59, 1 Chronicles 6, 1 through, through 3. And you'll see that Levi's lineage is completely too short for a 430-year lifespan, for a 430-year context of the enslavement of the children of Israel in Egypt. All right. So now. Next part, I want to go ahead and rebuttal through. Uh, some of these uh, points that people have I've spoken with I've brought up. As a matter of fact, for this, this one, I'm going to bring up this whole. This whole portion here. All right. Now, I spoke with a brother. And he and I and I and I gave him this information, passed along this information. It's simple math. It's not hard to understand, it's not hard to comprehend. But when you're indoctrinated by certain things and you don't want to let it go, or you're not trying to read the scriptures with an open mind, seeking for truth and not trying to propagate what was taught to you, because see, there's a difference between you teaching something. And you know full heartily that it's true, and you're just you know going on with the flow, versus trying to hold on to something once something is presented to you because you quote unquote don't want to dishonor your elders. Okay, but let's let's I want to pull out something that this brother pulled out, and he said, "Well, Acts chapter seven verse six said verbatim that they were in Egypt for 400 years. Now, first thing I want to bring out that's wrong with that statement is this doesn't say 430 like it did in Exodus 12 and 40 within the King James Version. So now you have a discrepancy. Is it 400 or 430? The next thing I want to pull out is that this is not talking about how long they were in Egypt. Because when you read this whole chapter, and I would advise anyone to read Acts chapter 7, the whole chapter, and what you're going to find out is that the context of this whole thing is giving a breakdown of certain portions of Israel's history to convey a end message to those who are being spoken to in regards to the coming forth of Christ. So basically, Acts chapter 7 is a history lesson that brings out specific and major points out of Israel's history because it doesn't give the complete history. It just gives what was most important and important details because the audience that this was spoken to are learned people of Israel. Okay. Now, what I want to show is what verse six is actually going over is what's spoken of in Genesis chapter 15, verse 12 and 14. This is not giving you how long they were in Egypt because look at this. When you read this, it says, And God spake on this wise, that his seed should sojourn in a strange land, and that they should bring them into bondage and entreat them evil 400 years. Now, basic reading comprehension skills should let you know that if you read Genesis 15, he just repeated Genesis 15, 12, and 14. Now he's going on with the chronology. And the nation whom they shall be in bondage will I judge, said God. And after that, they shall come forth and serve me in this place. Now, it's going forward. Next thing that happened. And he gave him the covenant of circumcision, talking about Abraham. And so Abraham began Isaac in the circumcision and circumcised him the eighth day. And Isaac began Jacob. 
and Jacob begat the 12 patriarchs. Now, two, no, three verses later, does the chapter mention Egypt? It said nowhere that they were in Egypt for 400 years. Nowhere. He was rehearsing the prophecy that was given to Abraham because that is one of the main prophecies in biblical history that everyone knows that that's what Abraham was looking to see. The fact that when he was given the river Nile to the Euphrates, he didn't get to see that, but he was promised that his children would see that. Now, I would argue for you to name me any point in time when the children of Israel ruled from the river Nile all the way to the river Euphrates. That complete territory that I showed. All right here. Show me one point in history when this ever happened. It never did. So this is the purpose of them rehashing this prophecy because this prophecy is very important in context of this whole chapter. That's why it was stated in verse 6. Then it goes down here three verses later and mentions Egypt, but it never mentioned in the same context of the 400 years in verse 6 or equal to that captivity. So that's a totally false and propaganda to just trying to keep pushing a doctrine. Now the next point I'm going to bring out is, is, is so heavy because we're going to see. Now we all know that Paul wrote the book Galatians, right? So let's see what Paul said. Because I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna prove a point that totally destroys even trying to bring up X outside of what I just put let's get a second witness because we all know that the scriptures say by the mouth of two or three witnesses that every matter should be established i've already given my rebuttal but now i just want to go over some of the things that people bring up so now let's read what paul wrote now to abraham and his seed were the promises made he say of not and to seeds as of many but as of one and to thy seed, which is Christ. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. So here we see in Galatians that Paul clearly just let you know that from the time that Abraham was given the covenant, entering into Canaan at the age of 75, to the time that the law came, which was Moses at age 80, leading the children of Israel out of Egypt, was 430 years. That completely agrees with the Masoretic. I mean, not the Masoretic. That completely agrees with the Samaritan Pentateuch, and also the Septuagint. You can't get around it. Now, the next point I want to bring out is this. We all know that Paul was present at the stoning of Stephen, right? So I'll ask you this. Why didn't he correct Stephen and say, hey, We weren't there 400 years because Stephen wasn't even trying to make this gesture that the 400 years that was mentioned in verse 6 is to be attributed to the captivity of Egypt. They never said that in the New Testament anywhere, that they were in Egypt for 400 years. This is something that's new that's been taught through the Masoretic text and the King James Version. As a matter of fact, let, let, let's get let's let's prove that Paul was there because they were already looking for a reason to shut Stephen up, but they couldn't because everything he was saying was truthful. So let's see.
uh, what is that verse? Let me look it up real quick. Because I don't know that verse by heart. And I don't want to Acts 22 and 20. Okay. There we go. Acts 22 and 20. It's a lot. Acts 22 and 20. So Paul was there. And when the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by and consenting unto his death and kept the raiment of them that slew him. So Paul was there when that discourse was going through. Let's go to back to Acts chapter 7. So Let's see what he's, we know this is Stephen giving this breakdown. Let's go back another chapter. Let's, let's see who was doing this. Uh-oh. We're seeing Stephen mentioned here. Oh, wow. So, we see, let's just read here, verse 9, Acts 6, verse 9. And there arose certain men of the synagogue, which called the synagogue of, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines and the um, Cretans and the Alexandrians and them of Sicilia, Sicilia, whatever, and Asia disputing with Stephen. So we see here in Acts chapter six, 7, it was Stephen that was talking. So Paul was there with Stephen. So why didn't Paul, when he wrote to the Galatians in chapter 3, tell them that it was 400 years? Paul clearly said, let's pull it up again. For those who want to be simple and stiff-necked, as our people have always been. Let's pull it up again. I, if Paul was there with Stephen, we know that Stephen was speaking right. Why is it that Paul didn't write down the same information that Stephen was saying if that? Acts 7 and 6 means that they were there 400 years. Because that's not what Acts 7 and 6 is saying. Because Paul was there. So he know it wasn't saying that. Because he said here clearly that it was 430 years after the covenant was given that the law came. So that's all I have in the video. I pray this was edifying for the elect. I pray that, you know, you can see this, study it out, go back through the video, watch it again, get the precepts. And with that, I say Shalom.